everybody. Great to see you today. So glad you're here. And uh, I think I heard Lauren say it's the first day of spring. Is that true? I didn't know that. That makes me feel especially good this morning. Wow. Uh, I do know that it's uh, the second week of Lent. And, you know, we're in this season where we're being very intentional about preparing our hearts for all that comes on Holy Week, particularly Good Friday and Easter. And um, I hope that all of you are finding a way to engage, perhaps uh, uh, in a more disciplined way than you might typically during this Lenten season. Hey, if we haven't met... If we haven't met, my name's Terry Smith. I'm the lead pastor here at the Life Christian Church. Uh, I had a, a new person uh, walking out of the lobby today, uh, kind of wanting to know who I was, and I realized I've been gone uh, a few weeks lately. And uh, what he said to me was kind of, uh, how did he say it? He said, uh, how, what is your availability on Sundays. He said, what, do you like speak once every few weeks or something? Well, uh, for those of you who've been around the last few weeks and in really enjoying our other wonderful speakers, you're stuck with me a lot. So uh, just know that, that uh, probably 40 weeks a year, I'm the I'm the bald-headed guy you're going to see up here teaching. I really appreciate uh, the great job that Christian and Ryan have done over the past couple of weeks as we're teaching our way through Hebrews, and uh, we'll continue to do that uh, through the month of April. So let me let me jump in today. Oh, um, so uh, I'm up a little sooner than I normally am because we're going to be receiving communion at the end of our service, and we wanted to make sure that we had plenty of time to enjoy that time together as we come together around the Lord's table and and receive this ancient covenant meal together, okay? Uh, so um, I don't typically start on a negative note, and I, I hope this isn't negative, but let me just say that uh, here's something that really disturbs me. It's that I find myself far too often a relationship, in a relationship of some sort or another with someone who makes promises they do not keep. And frequently this happens, far too frequently it seems, this happens with someone who has signed an agreement codifying their promises. So let's say, for instance, and I think most of you will relate with this, a contractor who promises X, Y, and Z, and they do X, and they do part of Y, and they don't do any of Z. And according to the agreement that they signed, the only way to ensure that they fulfill what they promised would be to take them to court which I'm loath to do. I think we're in a society that's far too litigious, so that's not something that uh, that it have to be pretty extreme for me to do that. But what I do know is that in court, that person would have to swear an oath to tell the truth about what they promised and face legal consequences if their promise confirmed by that oath is not fulfilled. And when that person swears an oath, typically... Uh, even yet today, they swear by something greater than themselves. And still in America, much to my surprise, many states have an oath. Their standard oath is still an oath where people swear to God. Um, Cornell Law School wrote an article about this. Uh, they wrote an oath is a public pledge that a person will perform some action or duty. I should tell you that I'm going to make a distinction over the next few minutes between making a promise and making an oath. An oath is a public pledge that a person will perform some action or duty generally with the promise of doing so truthfully. Oaths are often done, Cornell Law School says, in the name of a deity, like swearing under God. Another article says that an oath is a commitment made to the witness's deity or on their holy book. Um, though uh, most states will make a provision for someone who perhaps doesn't believe in God to make an oath in another way, um, this, for instance, is the standard oath in the state of California still today. You do solemnly state that the testimony you may give in the case now pending before this court shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God. This swearing an oath 
and swearing to something or someone greater than oneself has been going on for centuries, probably millennia, and goes on all over the world still today. To swear to God has always been considered the highest form of an oath, an oath that ends disagreement. I mean, once someone says, I swear to God, God-fearing people say, well, that settles that. If you're going to say it that seriously, that settles that issue. Now, in our world today, someone may swear to something um, less than God, but greater than themselves. For instance, uh, you can imagine a mob movie where a guy says, I swear on my daughter's life, saying in essence that if I'm not telling the truth and I don't keep this promise, you can take my daughter's life. And the reason that that's a pretty sacred oath is because the presumption is that there's nothing as precious to a parent as their child's life. But for time immemorial, people who believe in God instinctively know, as codified in law, that to swear to God is the most sacred oath, even more important than my child's life, is my relationship to God. It is unthinkable to offend God, to lie in his name, to receive his judgment. This is why when our president is sworn in, he, or someday I'm sure it will be a she, puts his hand on the Bible and swears an oath of office, so help him God. He's swearing an oath to something infinitely greater than himself. I say that because today we're going to talk at some length about how God himself swore an oath to keep promises he had already made. God himself swore an oath to keep promises he had already made. Now, some of your minds may be going to the teaching of Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount where Jesus said that we should have such integrity that we shouldn't need to swear in this way. However, God, in his desire to relate to fallible human beings, swore an oath to keep his promises, and we're told in Scripture that finding no one greater than himself to swear by, he swore by himself. In other words, God said, I swear to God that I will keep these promises that I've made to you, this is an amazing truth that is meant to give us confidence and to anchor our souls. So as we teach our way through Hebrews, here's today's text. Hebrews chapter 6, verses 13 to, through 20. When God made his promise to Abraham, since there was no one greater for him to swear by, he swore by himself, saying, I will surely bless you and give you many descendants. And so... After waiting patiently, Abraham received what was promised. People swear by someone greater than themselves, and the oath confirms what is said and puts an end to all argument. Because God wanted to make the unchanging nature of his purpose very clear to the heirs of what was promised, he confirmed it with an oath. God did this so that by two unchangeable things, notice the distinction, his promise, and his oath. God did this so that by two unchangeable things in which it is impossible for God to lie, we who have fled to take hold of the hope set before us may be greatly encouraged. We have this hope as an anchor for the soul, firm and secure. It enters the sanctuary behind the curtain where our forerunner, Jesus, has entered on our behalf. He has become a high priest forever in the order of Melchizedek. It's a powerful passage, and the ultimate aim of the passage is to encourage discouraged people and to hold this hope as an anchor for their soul. Ken 
Hughes in his commentary on Hebrews said about this text, God did not have to swear by an oath, but he did so as a condescension or accommodation to human weaknesses. So God's promises, God's oath should cause us to be greatly encouraged. God wanted so desperately, if you please, to make sure that we could believe what he said, that he swore an oath. Now, The writer of Hebrews in this text is setting up what happens in in the next several chapters of Hebrews, which is a lengthy discussion on how Jesus, through what he did on the cross, through the gospel, made a way for us into the presence of God and how he uniquely understands us and how he represents us in the heavenly court. And the writer of Hebrews is saying as he sets this up, therefore, because of what I'm about to say, if we're in relationship with Jesus, our very souls are anchored in God's presence. This causes us, regardless the difficulties we may face, to take hold of hope and to be secure. Remember, uh, for those of you who've been tracking with us since we started teaching through Hebrews at the beginning of January, that the writer to the Hebrews is a pastor, very scholarly pastor, who's writing to a group of very discouraged, commonly called Jewish Christians living in Rome in the mid-60s A.D., And they're so discouraged that many of them are thinking about leaving the faith and many of them have stopped attending services altogether. And there's a concern on the part of the writer of Hebrews that they're going to drift away. And he now is offering an anchor that is actually connected into the very presence of God to keep them from drifting. In Hebrews chapter 2 verse 1, which we taught at length about a few weeks ago, the writer said we must pay the most careful attention to who Jesus is, to what Jesus did, therefore to what we have heard so that we do not drift away. And now in Hebrews 6, he's saying, here's the anchor to keep you from drifting. And he connects it to the promise that God's made and the oath God made about who Jesus is and what Jesus has done and how this connects us into God's presence. And of course, the message to us at least in part in the year 2022, is that regardless the challenges we face, regardless the difficulties that we endure, regardless the discouragement that we may be tempted to buy into, that we have security and hope that anchors our soul because of who Jesus is and because of what Jesus did. Now, As I read this passage in Hebrews chapter 6 about God swearing an oath to Abraham, which is what he's referring back to here, and he's relating this to the promise and oath made through Jesus Christ at the cross, which we'll get to in a few minutes. When I read this passage, I think about two times that really stand out to me where God swore an oath to Abraham. In fact, um. The scholar Tremper Longman says that when God swore an oath to Abraham, that he swore a self-cursing oath. And that's a direct quote from Tremper Longman. That's not my term. He swore a self-cursing oath. In other words, when someone would swear an oath of the type that we're going to discuss today, they were calling down judgment on themselves. Just like if we said, I swear to God, and then we didn't keep the promise that there's an assumption that there's a consequence for having not kept the promise we made before God. God swore by himself a self-cursing oath. I think about this on two occasions. The first is in Genesis chapter 15, which I'll spend most of my time on today. And the second is in Genesis 22, which Hebrews 6 directly quotes in this passage. And I'll spend just a few minutes on that at the end of our time together. But the text in Genesis 15, where God swore again a self-cursing oath, is one of happens to be one of my favorite stories in all of Scripture. And I'm going to spend a little bit of time around it today. So let's let's organize the rest of the talk in two ways. First of all, the the first time that God made a self-cursing oath with Abraham is in Genesis 15. The second time is in Genesis chapter 22. Let's talk about Abraham for a minute. So I know most of most of us know who Abraham was, but it's good to uh, 
locate ourselves again uh, in who Abraham was and why this is relevant. For whatever reason, some 4,000 years ago, out of everybody in the world, God chose a guy named Abraham, and he made very unique promises to Abraham and to Abraham's seed. Why God chose Abraham, no one knows for sure, but he did. And uh, when he chose Abraham, he made promises, and ultimately, as we'll discuss, a covenant with Abraham, where God said, here are the things I'm going to do for you. These are encapsulated in what's commonly called the Abrahamic blessing that's found in Genesis chapter 12, verses 1 through 5, which is uh, where we see the beginning of God's relationship with Abraham. The Lord had said to Abram, Abram is Abraham's pre-covenant name. So I'll switch back and forth as scripture does from Abram to Abraham. The Lord had said to Abram, go from your country, your people, and your father's household to the land I will show you. I will make you into a great nation and I will bless you. I will make your name great and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you and whoever curses you, I will curse and all peoples on earth will be blessed through you. So, This was the promise God made to Abraham, and from Abraham then ultimately came the Jewish people, which are called in Scripture the seed of Abraham, and from the Jewish people came Jesus Christ, who was the ultimate fulfillment of these promises who were made to Abraham. He is the one through whom the whole world is blessed, okay? Uh, So now, fast forward from Genesis chapter 12 to Hebrews chapter 6, you fast forward about 2,000 years to these Jewish Christians who were the physical seed of Abraham and the spiritual seed of Abraham reading the words of this letter. And the writer of Hebrews is going to talk to them about something with which they are very familiar. He's going to talk to them about Abraham, and he's going to talk to him, them about the promise God made to Abraham, which is Genesis 12, and then he's going to talk to them about the oath God made to Abraham, and the purpose for all of that isn't so he can give them a history lesson, that which w- this might feel like a little bit today, but that wasn't the purpose. The purpose of the history lesson was to locate them in why they should not be dis- discouraged, but rather be encouraged, and why their soul is anchored in the security of who God is and our relationship with God, their relationship with God, our relationship with God through Jesus Christ. So, we have to spend a little bit more time talking about who Abraham was and about the promise and about the oath, because most of us are unfamiliar with the details of all of that. And so, uh, here's the first time then that God makes an oath, a so-called self-cursing oath to Abraham. Genesis 12, he makes the promise, but here's Genesis 15. The word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision. Do not be afraid, Abram, God says, I am your shield and your very great reward. But Abram said, sovereign Lord, what can you give me since I remain childless? Now, I love this. This is phenomenal. God, you have to almost say like this, God says to this guy, Abram, essentially, Abram, I love you. I'm in this with you. I'm going to be your very great reward. To which Abram doesn't say, whoa, that's great, God. Abram says, but God, you told me, now some 20 or 25 years have passed since Genesis 12, you told me 25 years ago that the whole world was going to be blessed through my progeny, and I haven't even had a child yet, and I'm almost 100 years old, and Sarah, my wife, is getting up in years, and I'm kind of thinking about plan B, I'm going to find a child myself that these blessings can come on. He says, God says, hey, Abraham, I'm with you, and Abraham says, but God... I mean, but Abram said, Sovereign Lord, what can you give me since I remain childless? And he complains a little bit. And then the word of the Lord came to him. A son who is your own flesh and blood will be your heir. And then God repeats the promise he made in Genesis 12, 
some 20, 25 years ago. He took him outside and he said, look up at the sky and count the stars if indeed you can count them. Then he said to him, so shall your offspring be. Abram believed the Lord and he credited it to him as righteousness. Very important text for all of scripture, but no time to deal with that today. Essentially, Abram says, okay, I believe your promise. And God says, okay, Abraham, the fact that you believe what I've said, I'm now going to count to count you to have been made right with me on the basis of your faith. But as wonderful as that is, that's not the end of the story. It goes on then to say, He also said to him, God speaking still, I am the Lord who brought you out of the earth of the Chaldeans to give you this land to take possession of it. Two very key parts of the promise God made to Abraham. God promised him that all the world would be blessed through his seed, and God promised Abram that he and his seed would occupy the land, the land that the Jews still miraculously occupy 4,000 years later. God promised that to Abram, and that was part of what was happening. But when God speaks to Abram, though Abram now lives in the land, he doesn't, he hasn't secured it. He's not occupied it. Certainly his seed hasn't occupied it because he didn't have a child yet. Abram's a nomad moving around through the land. He is a very rich nomad, but he's a nomad nonetheless. The point is to say that God has made promises to Abram, which at this moment, 20, 25 years later, have not been fulfilled yet. And Abram's a human being saying, God, you said, but I don't see it yet. I believe, but you know, I believe, but I guess really is kind of the bottom line. And then the text goes on to say, Abram said, sovereign Lord, how can I know that I will gain possession of it? This is a huge statement. I hope, even though we're talking about a story 4,000 years ago, that you can relate with this. God, I know you promised it. I believe, I believe, I believe. But how can I know? That's what Abram asked God. How can I know that I will gain possession of it? So the Lord said to him something that made perfect sense to Abraham, but doesn't, it doesn't make sense to people living in 2022. He said, Bring me a heifer, a goat, and a ram, each three years old, along with a dove and a young pigeon. Abram brought all these to him, cut them in two, and arranged the halves opposite each other. Some of you have heard me preach about this before. It is one of my favorite stories. And uh, I always have to be careful when I talk about this whole idea of animal sacrifice to at least say a couple of things because it's so mind-boggling to people who live today, especially if you're an animal lover, which I happen to be at least of late with my beautiful miniature schnauzer, Dietrich. It's kind of difficult to imagine sacrificing an animal. But then for all kinds of other reasons, in the sensibilities of the last couple thousand years in human society, it's difficult to imagine sacrificing an animal. But the reality is this was very common, not only among the, uh, the Jews, which Abraham is the father of the Jews. This isn't only common among the Jews in Judaism, but this was common in societies uh, all over the world, and particularly in the Near East where this story is located. There was this instinctive understanding that in order to assuage the demands of the deity, that, that life would have to be given in place of the person who didn't measure up to the deity. And this is especially true in the story of Scripture where we're told that the soul, you know, you make the choice to do things your way instead of God's way. The soul that sins will surely die. But in the Old Testament system, a sacrifice could be offered on behalf of the sinner so that the life of the sacrifice could take the place of the sinner. Well, nonetheless, Nonetheless, in the Old Testament, and we have to get into this coming weeks because a whole lot of what we're going to get into in Hebrews in the next few weeks is about how Jesus Christ becomes the sacrifice for the whole world so that a sacrifice like that never needs to be made again, okay? But when God says to Abram, go get these animals and sacrifice them, 
This made perfect sense to Abram, and even more than that, if we can move past the kind of oddity in today's world about the whole sacrifice thing, what's important to know is that when Abram said to God, how can I know you will keep your promise, God responded by essentially saying this, because I'm going to up the ante, and I'm not just going to make a promise to you, I'm going to swear an oath in the blood of of a covenant-making ceremony, all right? So Abram, this making perfect sense to him, he goes and gets these animals, and he brings them to to wherever it is that this is going to happen with God, and he cuts the animals in half. Now, it gets worse, but it's important that you know this for reasons you'll understand if you don't leave over the next few minutes, okay? You guys doing okay? Okay. When he cut the animals in half, he cut the animals in half with the object in part being to make a bloody, gory mess. And he cut the animals in half, as was common, from the head of the animal to the tail of the animal along its spine until one half of the animal fell one way and the other half of the animal fell another way. And you can only imagine there was a profusion of blood. This is supposed to be as uncomfortable as it make us, might make us feel. This is supposed to be a bloody story. And one, he has three animals. He doesn't cut the birds for whatever reason. I don't remember why. But he cuts these three animals, the heifer, the ram, the goat, in half along the spine. One half falls this way, another half that way. One half this way, another half this way. One half this way, another half this way. And in between the halves became what's called the alleyway of blood. And you can only imagine how much blood there is in between the halves of this animal. Then we're told that after Abraham makes these covenant cuts, that the birds of prey came down on the carcasses, but Abram drove them away. Now Abraham understands that the reason that God has asked him to make these covenant cuts is because God's about to swear an oath in blood to keep the promises he made 25 years ago. He understands that. And so you have to imagine that Abram's kind of excited in this whole thing. But after he cuts the animals, birds of prey, he's waiting for God, but instead of God showing up, birds of prey show up and start to try to eat at the carcasses of these animals. And, and Abram drove them the way. And as the sun was setting, Abram fell into a deep sleep and a thick and dreadful darkness came over him. The King James says, and, and horror of darkness came over him. Then the Lord shows up and God says, no for certain. And he begins to detail to him how these promises that he'd made a long time ago and it just repeated were actually going to come to pass. And the story closes like this. When the sun had set and the darkness had fallen, a smoking fire pot with a blazing torch appeared and passed between the pieces. The pieces of what? The pieces of these, this sacrifice. The blazing, don't, don't worry too much about trying to understand a smoking fire pot and a blazing torch. For one reason, nobody understands it. It's just, how God, who is unseen, manifests himself in that situation. The bottom line is God shows up and he walks in between the pieces of this sacrifice. And on that day, the Lord made a covenant with Abraham and said to your descendants, I will give this land. And he goes on and he shares detail. So I'll take a breath and try to explain this and why it's important as we sit here on the first day of spring, on a lovely day where no one thought you were going to come and hear somebody talk about animals being cut in half and blood and all that. By the way, a lot of pastors won't touch this kind of subject uh, because people look at the pastor like you're looking at me like, what? The fact is we can't really get into the rest of Hebrews unless we have some understanding around some of this. So this is a really important part of understanding Scripture. So, as I said a few moments ago, quoting Trimper Longman, when God made covenant with Abraham, he swore to a self-cursing oath. This 
In Genesis chapter 15 is the first time that a covenant is mentioned with Abraham. Again, it's important to note God had made promises, but he hadn't sworn an oath. God had made promises, but he hadn't made covenant. Covenant making happened in blood. And this is why uh, when you talk about covenant in the Old Testament, you talk about covenant and New Testament, you talk about the covenant being cut. The technical word is cut. The Hebrew for covenant actually means to cut. And the reason that's true is because when covenants were made, again, not just in Judaism, but in the Near East as a whole, when covenants were made, they were made, I've actually read scholars who say, always made in blood. This may be an animal that was uh, that was uh, sacrificed. This may have been uh, two people making a cut in their hand and mingling their blood together like I did with my friend Georgie Coogan when we were like third graders. We took rusty pocket knives out in the woods across the street from my house and made a little small incision and rubbed our hands together and said we're blood brothers, right? Anybody here ever do anything like that? Uh, first service, there are a bunch of people. Well, they're the kind of people that come to church earlier. I don't know <laughs> why, but you know, they, but why, why do people do that? It's an instinctive thing. The, 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 the idea of, of, of the sacredness and the life being in the blood. Or in some pagan lands, uh, covenant would be made with, with the parties who made covenant. Now I'm talking about covenants being made between people with some, with people actually drinking blood. Now that would never have happened in Judaism, but that happened. You've heard the phrase, blood is thicker than water. Some of you've heard me say this many times. Probably Probably said it at your wedding, Maria and Mel, because this is one of my favorite little wedding things. Blood is thicker than water. What do most people mean when they say blood is thicker than water? Well, it goes like this. A young married couple, because older married couples would never do anything this foolish, get in an argument. Older married couples get into arguments, but we wouldn't say, you know, your mama or something like that, <laughs> right? <laughs> And, and, and when one person says, your mama, the other person says, blood is thicker than water. And what the person means who says that is, the blood of my familial relationship is more sacred than this little thing we have called a marriage. Blood is thicker than water. But in fact, that's the exact opposite of what the expression means. This expression came from this idea of cutting covenant. And the idea is that the blood of the covenant is thicker than the water of my mother's womb. So I have a sister. I love my sister. And uh, we shared the same embryonic fluid. Do you understand? But as much as I love my sister, my relationship with my wife is infinitely more sacred because we stood before God, if you please, swearing before God and witnesses that we were committed to each other in a unique relationship unlike any other until death do we part. So my relationship, some of you actually, maybe you came today just to hear this part of the sermon. My relationship with my wife is a covenant relationship. It is infinitely more sacred than my relationship with my dad, my mom, my sister. The blood of the covenant is thicker than the water of my mother's womb. Now see, when you look at the Bible and it's organized as old covenant and new covenant and everything about the meal we're about to share in a few moments is about it being a covenant meal. You, you can't understand scripture the way it's meant to be spent, uh, uh, understood unless you comprehend on some level the significance of a covenant made in blood. And so, from any number of sources, we learn then how covenants were cut, both in Scripture, we see examples of this, and then there are other historical evidences about how covenants were, were, were made in a general way in, in all kinds of cultures in the Near East, in the time, at the time of Abraham, and in other, you know, in centuries on either side of Abraham. So here, real quickly, are, is, is, is how covenants would be cut. First of all, an agreement would be made. So two parties would come together. Guys, I need a little bit more uh, 
volume up here, probably not out there, but up here, and I probably won't project as much out there. Uh, so first of all, an agreement would be made. So two tribes or families or nations or individuals would make an agreement as to what promises they would make to one another. Um, they, 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 they'd make an agreement. We'll fight for you. We'll uh, uh, share our wealth. We'll uh, move our border, whatever it might have been. They would make an agreement. Then they would send representatives to actually make covenant. Promises were just promises. Promises were worth about as much as that landscaping contractor, your landscaper sign. That in order to enforce it, you'd have to if, if something didn't go right, you'd have to get someone to make an oath, which is someone swearing before God in a court of law. Do you understand? So you'd make the agreement, but the agreement's just the agreement. Now the covenant making is where the oath is uttered. And, and typically the representatives who would make covenant would be someone who embodied the characteristics of both parties. Both parties should be able to look at this person and see themselves in that person. There was always an understanding that the person making covenant was making covenant for more than themselves, but they were making covenant for everyone that they were representing and sometimes generations of people they were representing. For instance, in the Mosaic covenant in Deuteronomy chapter 29, Moses said, I am making this covenant with its oath, not only with you who are standing here with us today in the presence of the Lord, our God, but also with those who are not here today. So covenant is made on the behalf of other people. Third, a site would be chosen often that was situated in such a way that many people could witness the cutting of the covenant. Covenant. The idea is that people want to see this oath that's being made on their behalf being made if in fact they, that was a possibility. Fourth, a sacrifice, presumably an animal or animals, would be chosen and the covenant cut made. Again, it was necessary that the covenant was made in blood. Um, uh, the, the, the story with Abraham isn't the only time that we see this in the Old Testament. For instance, in Jeremiah, Jeremiah 34, verse 18, those who have violated my covenant, God said, and have not fulfilled the terms of the covenant they made before me, I will treat like the calf they cut in two and then walk between its pieces. By the way, uh, uh, Trimper Longman, the scholar, uh, says something interesting uh, about that, referring to the covenant that God makes with Abraham in Genesis 15. He says, God, where, where these animals are cut in half, he said, God immediately assures Abraham that he will still have a son. What follows is a strange event that is explained by appeal to ancient Near Eastern custom. When an agreement was reached between two parties, it was occasionally sealed by a self-cursing oath. Through such an oath, the partners would call down a curse, even death on themselves, should they break the agreement. God, in the story with Abraham goes through the parts of these animals, calling the self-curse on his own head, so to speak. In effect, God is saying that if he breaks this promise, he may be killed like these animals. Of course, it's absurd to say that God could die, but it is equally absurd to say God could break his promise. So you cut the animals in half. For one thing, you're, you're creating the blood, which is necessary for a covenant to be made in. And another word, in another way, you're making a statement. If I don't keep the oath I'm making, may I be like these animals whose parts we're walking through. Fifth, the provision of the the provisions of the covenant would be sworn to. So now you have to imagine these two parties standing in between the two halves in the alleyway of blood. And now they're walking back and forth in the alleyway of blood. And they are probably saying with a voice loud enough for those witnessing to hear, I swear to you that I will. And they would list, enumerate the promises they were making, which now makes the promise an oath. And then the two representatives would confirm the agreement they had made in several ways. A beautiful place you see this is in, Gen is in 2 Samuel chapter 18, where David and Jonathan make a covenant with one another. And when they finished making a covenant with one another, Jonathan, the son of, of King Saul, the first king of Israel, David, of course, the second king of Israel, when they made a covenant, they exchanged three things. They exchanged outer garments, which represented who they essentially were. They, they exchanged weapons, which represented their strength. They exchanged girdles. I know that seems like a strange thing to say today, but that the, these were the girdles were belts that they would use to tie around their robe to keep the robe from getting in their way and be 
because of the proximity of the belt to their reproductive organs, it was a symbol of life. They would say, I actually give you my life, and the other person would give them their life as well. And then covenants would often, almost always, be sealed by blood, mingling the blood uh, uh, in some cultures, like I said earlier, drinking the blood. But the idea is that there would be a seal of the covenant made in blood. Frequently then, names would be changed. You see this happen in Scripture frequently when God would make covenant with someone, he would change their name. He would give them a covenant name, which just in case I forget to say this later, this is part of of, of what the the covenant making that happens in baptism. When we take on ourselves the name of Jesus Christ, that's a way that we're entering covenant and that we're taking on ourselves that covenant name. And then finally, a covenant meal would be shared. The parties would mingle, eat, fellowship, and they would always eat or drink uh, two things. And those two things were they would eat bread and they would drink wine or something that represented blood. I know that there are uh, probably a lot of folks who don't understand a lot about Scripture may think this, this whole idea of communion or the covenant meal started with Jesus before he went to the cross. But Jesus was doing something that had been done before him for at least 2,000 years. The first covenant meal we see is a covenant meal between Abraham and this guy named Melchizedek who gets a lot of play in Hebrew, who represented God. Abraham Uh, They had a covenant meal together, which is bread and wine. You read about it in Genesis 14 if you want to. And then Abraham tithed. It's the first tithe that's ever given in Scripture. Abraham's response to the covenant that was made between him and God was to tithe. It was an instinctive thing that happened. And so for when Jesus sat at the Last Supper and had this meal of bread and wine, it was in a 2,000-year tradition of what a covenant meal looked like. They ate bread at the end of making covenant, which was to say, we are flesh of flesh, and they drank wine at the end of making covenant, which is to say, we are now blood of blood. Okay. Genesis 15. God says, I'm going to repeat myself a little bit and start to, start to wrap this up. God says, Abram, I'm your reward. And Abram says, 25 years ago, you told me I was going to have a son. I haven't had a son. And God says, Abram, I'm telling you, you're going to have a son. And God takes him outside. And God says, Abram, look up at the stars of the sky. You see them? As many of the stars are, that's how your seed's going to be. And then he says, look at the sand that you're walking on. As much sand as there is in this desert, so it is that your seed's going to be like the sand in this desert. And Abram says, I believe God. And God says, well, I count you as being right with me. And then Abram says, but God, how can I know that you're going to give me a seed? And how can I know you're going to give me a lamb? And God says, okay, go get the animals. Because now I'm going to take the promise and I'm going to make an oath. And Abraham goes and he gets the heifer and he gets the ram and he gets uh, the goat and he brings it to the covenant site. And you can only imagine the kind of effort it takes in that hot, arid desert for Abram to go and to secure these animals and bring them to the site and get things ready. And then he goes through the incredible effort of taking, I suppose, a sword or some kind of incredibly sharp knife instrument type of thing. And he cuts those animals who are living. He cuts them from the the top of their head to their tail along the spine until one half falls one way and the other half falls another way and blood shooting all over the place. And before long, there are six halves of three animals in an alleyway of blood. And Abraham by now has to be a little tired and he's waiting for God because he knows what's about to happen. He knows what's about to happen is God's about to show up and swear with an oath in the blood of a covenant that he's going to do the things that he promised him. And Abraham's waiting, but God doesn't come. Instead of God coming, these birds of prey start coming to try to eat these these carcasses. And Abraham now slipping and sliding and driving away these birds of prey. And finally, he ends up utterly exhausted. And he lays down ostensibly in that bloody mess. And he falls into a deep horror of sleep. And Scripture says, darkness came. And while he's laying there asleep in that dark exhausted place 
God shows up. And God starts to walk between the pieces in the alleyway of blood. And God said, Abraham, I promised you, but now I swear an oath. I swear an oath in the blood of this sacrifice that I'm going to give you a seed that's going to be like the stars in the sky and I'm going to give you a seed that's going to be like the sand in the desert and I'm going to give you this lamb that we're standing on right now. God says, I swear by myself. Abraham, I looked for someone else greater than me to swear by, but being able to find no one greater than me to swear by, I swear by myself, Abraham, if I could die, I'm telling you that I would be like the pieces of this sacrifice. If I don't keep my promise to you, Abraham, I can't die, but neither can I break my word. I swear with an oath, I'll keep these promises to you. When Jesus sat at the Last Supper, Mark tells us that he took the cup and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them and they all drank from it. And then Jesus said, this is my blood of the covenant which is poured out for many. He didn't say this is the blood of the covenant that when I die on the cross, it's going to kind of be a pretty type of thing and I'm going to bleed maybe a little bit, but avert your eyes and people are going to make pretty statues and hang them around their neck and it's going to be not that bad, guys. No, Jesus is sitting there letting it know, be known that he is about to become the sacrifice in which God is going to make an oath to keep the promises that he had made to humanity since the beginning of time. And Jesus sits there and says at that covenant meal, guys, my body is about to be torn into. Blood is going to be poured out. It's going to be a horrible thing. But I'm going to make covenant with you. And when Jesus Christ hung on the cross, he became, if you please, the heifer, the ram, the goat. Do you understand? He became the sacrifice. His body was not just kind of in some agony, but it's as if Hebrews uses terminology like it was ripped in two. And Jesus struggles and he fights for life. And then finally, utterly exhausted, able to breathe no more, he says, it is finished. And he falls into but a deep horror of sleep and darkness covers the whole world. But then God, if you please, shows up in that alleyway of blood and God says, I swear with an oath in the blood of this sacrifice, that everything I have ever promised humanity, I now can tell you, I swear, my promises are going to come true. When the writer of Hebrews says to those discouraged Christians in the first century, guys, I know you're having a tough time. I know you're thinking about giving up. I know you're discouraged. I know it's dark right now. But he said, let me tell you something. Let me tell you about two things by which it's impossible for God to lie. Let me remind you of his promise. Let me remind you of his oath. Let me remind you that God swore in the blood of the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. He's not going to leave you. He's not going to forsake you. You can't give up. God is with you. In fact, you are so secure that it's if you have an anchor into the very presence of God and you're not not going to drift away. And this is why as we sit here today in 2022, whatever darkness you're facing, whatever discouragement, you know, I realize, I realize some of us, you know, it's only human sometimes, guys, to say, God, I know, I know you said, I know what it said in your word, but 
I lost my job last week. How can I know? My little girl's sick. I, I, I believe you, God. I believe you're going to take care. But how can I know? Lord, I know your word says that you give me joy, but I'm struggling with depression right now. I feel so dark. How can I know? And the writer of Hebrews says, hey guys, regardless how you're feeling right now, I want to tell you it is impossible for God to lie because he swore by himself in the blood of a covenant. And if God is God, it is impossible for him to not keep his word. The second time God offers a self-cursing oath, which I've run out of time. But I've said what I, I really feel like I need to say. So I just say this to you, for those of you following along verse by verse, is in Genesis chapter 22, which is what's directly quoted in the Hebrew 6 passage, which is today's text. It's where God then says to Abraham, Hey, Abraham, um, I want to know that you're willing to keep your part of this covenant. And I, I need to know that you're willing to offer the promise I've now given you and Isaac back to me. It's a difficult story to explain, difficult story to understand, except to say that Abraham is willing, knowing that even if his son dies, God would raise him from the dead, Hebrews 11 tells us. And after Abram showed his willingness, the scripture uses the term obedience. Then God comes along and says, Abraham, I swear with an oath. Again, I swear with an oath that I'm going to keep this promise to you. All of this, the promise, the oath, the purpose of all of this is to anchor our souls. I want so desperately this week for you to know that God's promises in your life are going to come to pass. And here over the next few moments as we come around the Lord's table and we eat this ancient covenant meal together, I want you to think about anything it is that God's promised in your life, anything it is that you're believing for, and I want you to hear God's voice speaking to you that he swears by himself that anything he's truly promised is going to come true in your life. Would you please stand with me?